Thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you're new here, welcome. My name is Ira and I make video essays about different topics while painting something. Today's video is going to discuss the modern social media version of the eat the rich philosophy and specifically the conflict between our criticism of wealth and privilege and our admiration of it. And we're going to have this conversation by focusing on Olivia Jade as a perfect case study for this dichotomy and also to revisit how this topic was covered on social media to ask if the portrayal of Olivia Jade and her connection to the college admission scandal were justified. Before we get directly into the topic of today's video, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to start streaming on Twitch, which is something that I wanted to do for years. I'll talk a bit more about why, where, and when at the end of this video so that I don't waste any more of your time and without any further ado, Let's paint an essay. Every now and again, a new scandal involving the 1% pops up on our screens and papers, which reignites the Eat the Rich dialogue, a dialogue centered around the unethical nature of the gross hoarding of resources and exploitation of social positions by a few individuals who also display a detachment from what the rest of us experience as reality. Eat the Rich is a dialogue of frustration and an attempt of education on topics like class exploitation and sociopolitical ethics and usually addresses pop culture to do so, seeing as, unlike during the French Revolution, the uber-rich are now extremely visible to us peasants through media and the parasocial relationships that it cultivates. One of the most recent waves of the Eat the Rich dialogue on social media specifically took shape in 2020 as a response to the truly unbelievable trend of wealthy celebrities trying to use the pandemic to foster relatability. Imagine all the people living for today. Yeah. That was a complete and utter nightmare. And even worse, as an opportunity to give the public condescending lectures about braving through quarantine in their yachts and mansions. Another recent wave on social media that draws from the Eat the Rich philosophy is the recent popularity of the nepotism discussion and the role of privilege and connections in the careers of many of our favorite musicians, actors, and even authors. Social media's Eat the Rich is, in my opinion, the most education-focused one, I would say, and it has the least bit of vitriol towards the rich. The the rich aren't really called to be eaten, but rather knocked down a peg. But there are a few cases where our interpretation of this philosophy drew closer from the source material, and rather than try to cultivate a meaningful dialogue about ethics, morals, or even transparency, we found targets to unleash feelings of resentment, aggression, and frustration that have to do with class, wealth, and unfairness. In today's video, I thought I'd focus on the versions of Eat the Rich that call for the actual takedown of the wealthy and the celebration and joy in watching and contributing to their demise, while incorporating the other side of the coin by addressing our obsession and fascination for wealth and the wealthy, and try to understand how the obsession and vitriol interact. And the perfect case study for doing all of this is, in my opinion, Olivia Jade. We have a very peculiar relationship with the uber-rich and famous. On the one hand, we admire them, on the other, we criticize them. We allocate their level of wealth and influence moral values, but we are extremely aware that their level of wealth is often achieved through immoral or at least not entirely ethical means. We watch hours of content where the rich and beautiful show us their homes, their every color on the rainbow Birkin rooms and anally organized pantries, and we daydream. But we also participate in discussions of how unethical this level of wealth and item fetishism is. Olivia Jade embodies this conflict we have with wealth in a very obvious way, as she both benefited from our admiration of glamorous lifestyles, as well as suffered directly from our criticism around what these lifestyles represent. So let's start at the beginning. Who is Olivia Jade? Olivia Jade started her YouTube channel in 2015 when she was just 14 years old. Already in her introduction video, a few things stand out. Firstly, she seems outgoing, confident, and lets her personality shine, which is great and also quite rare to see in the first video. First videos are usually quite awkward and people tend to seem a lot more shy and uncomfortable, <laughs> myself included. The other thing that stands out is the production quality. The camera and audio qualities are quite good 
good, especially for a teenager in that time making their first video. Both of these facts already helped Olivia Jade stand out among new channels in her genre and age group, and she reached 2,000 subscribers by her sixth video, an achievement she celebrated with a giveaway for her growing audience, which is yet another advantage Olivia had over similar channels who probably couldn't afford treating their audience with giveaways this early into their YouTube journey. The most obvious thing Olivia Jade was able to take advantage of, however, was her access to celebrity culture. As the daughter of a famous actress, she would get invited to film premieres, the attendance of which she could vlog. And as a cherry on top of the cake, her actress mother, Laurie Lachlan, began participating in her daughter's videos, and those videos would perform incredibly well, allowing Olivia Jade to grow her platform rather quickly. While her personality was definitely appealing to her audience, it is undoubtable that her coming from a wealthy, well-connected family gave her channel a massive boost. Her focusing predominantly on makeup, beauty, and lifestyle content allowed her to make the most of her privileged circumstances. Her videos were always aesthetically pleasing to watch, she was able to display new clothes and makeup at high rates, she vlogged her luxurious vacation, and of course she could provide a glimpse to a life that the great majority of YouTubers just couldn't, which was not only the life of wealth but that of fame. Soon into her YouTube journey, she began collabing with other famous influencers. Back to my channel. <laughs> Today I'm here with one of my really good friends, Mel, who you guys also probably know on YouTube as Mel Joy. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm here with a special guest, Maddie. The fast growth of her channel showed that a glimpse into the life of someone like Olivia Jade was something that a lot of people were interested in and responded really well to. Having what seemed like the perfect recipe for social media success, Olivia Jade quickly became one of the best-known beauty and lifestyle influencers, getting coveted sponsorships and collaborating with brands like Sephora. She was also able to tap into a more mature audience with her starting her academic journey at the prestigious USC. Her college content was mostly focused around what she eats, dressing up her dorm room, going out to parties, as despite of her getting into one of the best universities in the US, she wasn't shy about admitting that academics are not on the forefront of her mind. I do want the experience of like game days, partying, I don't really care about school, as you guys all know. <laughs> A statement that she would very soon come to regret as something was about to happen that would make the very privilege that catapulted her social media career come right back to bite her. In March 2019, news broke about 50 individuals being indicted for their roles in a widespread college scheme, which took place in several of the highest-ranked American universities such as USC, Yale, and Georgetown between the years of 2011 and 2019. These individuals were found to have paid over $25 million collectively to bribe their children's way into these prestigious universities, the strategy for most of that being posing the kids as athletes and bribing their ways into college teams as well as bribing their way through the SAT process to either change their scores or have someone else take the test for them. While news articles provided that the individuals involved were prominent in high society and their professions included, quote, CEOs of private and public companies, successful security and real estate investors, two well-known actresses, a famous fashion designer, and the co-chairman of a global law firm. Most of these weren't named publicly in articles and their identity could be discovered by doing your own research, but to individuals who did get named in the great majority of articles and had their pictures displayed in said articles were actresses Felicity Huffman and Lori Loughlin. Now there isn't anything surprising about that, most people would recognize an actor as opposed to CEOs and co-chairmen of global law firms and would care more about the article if it's about someone they recognize. So these two women effectively became the faces of the college admission scandal in mainstream media coverage, while the the daughter of one of them immediately became the face of it on social media. YouTube post the admission scandal demonstrates the very strange dichotomy in our relationship with wealth and privilege. The social media coverage on Olivia Jade in direct relation to the scandal included not only speculation about how much she knew and what her actual role might have been, but her content was being looked at with a new lens and things that nobody really seemed to have a problem with in regards to her content before and even were the very things that helped her grow her platform and cultivate her audience suddenly became massive points of contention. Where I believe 
believe this sudden criticism came from was that one of the charms of YouTube as a platform is that everyone starts at zero and grow from there. While it isn't a secret that YouTube and social media in general are not democratized, and this is the most obvious by the fact that celebrities who start a YouTube channel already bring in an audience with them and grow much faster on the platform, it's still a very disheartening realization. Because it feels less like wealth gives you an advantage and more like lack of resources are a massive disadvantage. I think a lot of people came at it from the perspective that life should award us based on merit and that's also why Olivia Jade's use of her privilege to grow her platform tied in perfectly with her parents paying her way into a college she would not have been able to attend otherwise. While this sentiment is completely understandable, there is still something that feels disingenuous about how people began criticizing Olivia Jade for her content specifically. People began dissecting her videos and making compilations centered around how much of a brat she is, how wealthy she is and how her wealth gave her such an advantage while growing her platform. But what I find interesting is that this wasn't a secret in the sense that Olivia Jade's content from the beginning included displaying her luxurious lifestyle, showing off her designer items and lavish vacations. Unlike the college scandal, which for the first time shed light on how she got into college, and this is clearly something people would want to talk about, her wealth and privilege were always the center appeal to her content. So it definitely felt like people wanted to take apart something that they actively took part in. It's no secret that wealth goes a long way on social media because people want to see it, so it's a bit strange how suddenly the narrative was about almost punishing Olivia Jade for showing people something that they clearly wanted to see. One explanation for this dichotomy in general was explored in a study from 2021 where participants demonstrated that they are more likely to associate individual wealth to meritocracy and group wealth to inequality and exploitation. This leads to uncertainty in regards to legislation or other actions taken to bridge the wage gap because individuals effectively support and reject extreme wealth simultaneously. The reason for this conflict, according to the study, is cognitive. Quote, the amount of wealth obtained by the wealthiest members of society can be disturbing, but it is less disturbing when imagining an individual person's wealth rather than the wealth of a class of people. This is interesting, but of course doesn't seem to apply in our case study where one individual was criticized for the actions or general lack of ethics of an entire socio-economical class of people. In other words, Olivia Jade seemed to be the exception of the rule and was effectively scapegoated. During the peak of the admission scandal, people have noted that Olivia Jade was certainly made to be the face of the scandal, if you will, and the great majority of backlash was directed at her. This is despite of the fact that she was not only far from the only person involved, but also not likely the person actively engaging in the scam. What I mean by that is that despite of her probable knowledge of what was going on, it was not her behind the wheel, but her parents who were actively engaged in the process logistically and in terms of intention. Olivia Jade made it quite clear that she is not interested in going to college in the first place and she was already creating a successful social media career for herself so it's very unlikely that it was her idea and it's not difficult to imagine or speculate that her parents almost forced her into it. From the 50 people charged in the admission scam, people associated the scandal with just a handful of people. Felicity Huffman, Lori Lachlan, her partner Massimo and their two daughters, one of whom was Olivia Jade. While mainstream media seemed to have focused more on Lori, social media certainly focused on Olivia Jade and it's interesting to try and understand why. One very possible answer is that Olivia Jade made a career on social media. She had years worth of content that was able to be scrutinized under a new context. Her lifestyle was being looked at as disgustingly privileged instead of aesthetically pleasing, inspirational or even envious. The very thing that gave her an advantage in terms of social media success was now being used against her. And it was very easy to use it against her as opposed to the other people involved because her privileged life was available for everyone to examine and that of others wasn't. There was so much to reanalyze that she naturally became the center of the conversation. While this explanation makes perfect sense, it still can't be the catalyst in my opinion because as already mentioned, Olivia Jade was the child of the conspirators and so not on the same level of involvement. I personally have not seen anyone try to analyze the social medias of the children of the other parents involved. In fact, no one really seems to care who they or their parents are and for all we could know, they could have public social medias documenting their privilege and flexing even harder than than Olivia Jade ever did. Another option I began thinking about while researching this topic is a bit more psychological and has more to do with retribution. And to explore that, we have to talk about the manner in which Olivia Jade responded to the backlash. 
Olivia Jade is back on Instagram and she has a message for every news outlet that covered her family scandal. The criticism around the scandal itself in regards to Olivia Jade focused on the complete lack of ethics and integrity shown by her, especially because she did make a lot of college-related content and, as mentioned, wasn't shy about mentioning how little she actually cares about studying and instead only cares about the social aspects of college. This struck people as shocking once news of the bribery scandal hit because it seemed unbelievable she would have the audacity to profit from content related to her college experience and be so upfront about how how little effort she put into academic work, knowing that her being in that college in the first place was due to a scam and, likely, was at the expense of an actual athlete who needed the scholarship. While at the time, and still today, no one was privy to how much she knew, it did come out that she posed on a rowing machine so that she could be photoshopped to appear as a rower on her high school team. Aside from that, she has been upfront about not having the best achievements in high school, so it's very unlikely she thought she would just authentically get into to one of the best universities in the country. Once the news exploded, Olivia Jay decided to take time off from social media and people thought she might use this time to reflect on the situation and her responsibility in the matter. However, about six months later, she posted this image to Instagram where she's flipping the camera off while news outlets that have been covering the situation with a special focus on her and her mother have all been tagged in the caption. This obviously was extremely upsetting because it showed she had no understanding or at least did not care about the extent of her wrongdoing. This post felt like a complete slap to the face to people for many different reasons. Those who were under tremendous stress at their colleges, those who got rejected from the college of their choice despite of working extremely hard throughout high school, either academically or in sports, and those who struggle paying off their student debts. The criticism also had the wealth and privilege aspects in common, as it was truly outrageous to think that one could be involved in a scam, shamelessly make money off of it by making content Content while not being truthful about the circumstances, and then respond to the backlash by telling everyone to basically fuck off and showing zero remorse or sense of accountability. And it's very hard not to agree with all of this outrage. At the time, I remember being quite angry as well, and this situation for me was very much a reminder of how untouchable the elite really are. However, whether by seeing the error of her ways or as a final attempt for some redemption before coming back to YouTube, Olivia Jade went on the Facebook show Red Table Talk on December 2020. Having had a lot of time to reflect on the situation, she did show a lot more maturity during the interview and while it is possible that she wasn't being genuine and said whatever she felt she needed to say to be able to move forward and go back to making content, I personally feel that one of the points she made was extremely important and interestingly, this very thing rubbed people the wrong way. When all this first happened and it became public, I, I remember thinking, which my thoughts are completely different now, yeah, but right. I remember thinking, how are people mad about this? Like, right. I know that sounds so silly, but in the, in the bubble that I grew up in, I didn't know so much outside of it. And a lot of kids in that bubble, their parents were donating to schools and yes. doing stuff that advantage, mm -hmm. there were so many advantages. So when it was happening, it didn't feel wrong. It didn't yeah. feel like that's not fair. A lot of people don't have that. I was in my own little bubble, right. focusing about my comfortable world. Right. I never had to look outside of that bubble. Olivia Jade saying that her lack of response was due to the fact that she didn't understand why people make such a big deal out of this because in her social environment, what she and her parents had done was normal is actually an extremely mature thing to say and shows a lot of self-awareness. People saw it for the most part as bratty instead and as a cop-out. I believe the difference of perception comes from context. People might have understood it as an excuse for why she and her family did what they did, while I personally believe she was explaining why it was so difficult for her to understand and listen to the criticism. In that sentence, she expressed what I see as a moment of realization that she's been living in a bubble that is very disconnected from most people's realities, and this bubble has different rules of moral conduct. She spoke about the disillusion she felt when she was finally able to understand what her privilege means in the real world, and for the first time she could truly see what people were mad at. If what she said truly reflects how she feels and not something that a publicist told her to say, I would imagine the identity crisis she went through was quite brutal. Realizing that something your social environment normalizes is actually extremely morally corrupt is not easy to come to terms with. However, as mentioned, people still perceived this as a gross display of privilege. People had no sympathy for Olivia Jade and either were tired of talking about her or continued to see her as the face of the scandal and proceeded to promote 
out harsh sentiments towards her. Even after, she did what people were asking her by showing that she understands why people are mad and apologized, and even though it's already been made clear that the issue is much bigger than her. It's possible that Olivia Jade was at the center of vitriol because she was the only one we as the public could actually punish. And this led us to want to punish her not only for her role in the scandal that started the whole conversation, but for everything Eat the Rich represented. I thought about this because I've heard several people at the time discuss the sentences those who were charged received for their crimes. Those who were actually sentenced to serve jail time only had to do it for a couple of months, and the institutions they served their times in sounded almost like yoga retreats, and this was infuriating to many people, myself included. Cases of how lower class individuals are treated by the justice system began being brought into the conversation, and examples of teenagers who received significantly longer sentences in very different correctional facilities for crimes like dealing weed began being compared to the laughable, barely slip on the wrist punishments the admission scandal participants got. It was painfully clear that the wealthy, for the most part, are under untouchable and are beyond even the justice system. But here was someone whose punishment was kind of in our hands. We could physically take opportunities from her by pressuring her sponsorships and collaborations. We could punish her in her own comment section and directly affect her bottom line. Perhaps subconsciously we perceived her as the weak link and directed all of our anger at the general injustice of wealth and privilege and we turned her into the perfect scapegoat to channel what we felt is well-deserved punishment in the form of a global wave of hate. But was it retribution or just a way to make us feel better? We know that the wealthy are more likely to get away with things that those with lesser means would not. We are aware the system is almost built around benefiting those with resources. Seeing a wealthy person experience hardship that we perceive they deserve to experience may feel like retribution. It may give us the sense of balancing out the scales just a little bit, even if in reality, or in the grand scheme of things, the world is not any more balanced than it was. The amount of global criticism Olivia Jade and her family received with the admission scandal did not make wealthy people any more inclined to play fair or refrain from abusing their resources and privilege. We are also not really any more powerful than we were before the Janulis were exposed. And even at the time, people highly doubted that universities would make any more effort to make the admission process more fair or based on merit. And in fact, while universities post the admission bribery scandal went into damage control and began discussing all of the ways in which the system will be improved to ensure that things like this will not happen again, I think it was obvious that little is going to change. A year after the scandal showed several systems put in place to at least appear as if a change was made, while articles like this one from Time demonstrated that if someone wants to bribe their children's way in, they will just likely have to pay a bit more and go through slightly more bureaucratic obstacles. Most of the attempts for change are actually coming from nonprofit organizations who work to assist low-income students in their application process. And while their work is needed, it is also unfortunate to admit that they probably have the least amount of power in the matter. Those charged with connection to the scandal mostly were able to go back to their lives after serving some time in a fancy facility. It's not surprising, but it's clear to see that nothing was substantially changed by the massive reaction to the admission fraud, aside perhaps from Olivia Jade being directly affected by something much bigger than her. And you may think that you're fine with that. As was mentioned by several commentators, she's a rich white girl and she's going to be fine. There are a lot more people in the world whom our empathy is better directed towards. And it wouldn't be unfair of you to hold that opinion. I don't entirely disagree with that sentiment myself. The thing is that since I highly doubt anyone expected the wave of criticism directed right at Olivia Jade to make a real difference, it's interesting to understand why our energy was so focused on punishing her. And the thing that comes to mind is the concept of schadenfreude, getting pleasure from someone's perceivably deserved misfortune. There is a proven correlation between perceived status, wealth stereotypes, and schadenfreude, as studies have managed to prove that people are less inclined to feel empathy for those with a high status and are more inclined to get pleasure from the misfortune of those with a high status. This is because we associate the misfortune with a stereotype versus with a real person. This exact correlation was proven in regards to different types of prejudices as well, which isn't surprising. People tend to see individuals they don't know personally as representatives of a group 
and if prejudice against that group exists, the individual is seen as a stereotype of that group and their personal misfortune is then associated with the well-deserved misfortune of the whole group. Social media's Eat the Rich demonstrates that quite perfectly. Olivia Jade became a stereotype of the bulldozing, exploitative elite who live by separate rules and use their wealth and privilege to get away with things the average person simply would not. She became a symbol for the wealthy, taking opportunities away from those who are more deserving and more in need of those opportunities. By posing as a member of an athletic team and effectively taking a spot from an actual athlete who worked hard at their craft. This celebration of others' misfortune by the Eat the Rich trend can also be perfectly demonstrated in the public reaction to the fire Festival, as the perceived financial status of the participants was enough not only to disregard what they went through, but also to celebrate it. In reality, we didn't know for a fact that every one of those people were extremely rich or privileged. Some could theoretically have used their savings to end up in that situation. And sure, you could say that using your savings to go to a party advertised to the extra privileged specifically is a sign of stupidity. The reality is that celebrating what happened at the fire festival punished the participants instead of the organizers, who if anyone were the ones who deserved the vitriol. The memes from the fire festival situation and the commentary of it kind of made light of the whole situation and in a way made the ones who organized it and allegedly frauded everyone from their money as some kind of heroes for making it happen, despite of them acting from insane privilege and lack of ethics and moral conduct themselves. And yet we saw the reaction to the fire festival as a collective stance against immoral levels of wealth and privilege. Should Olivia Jade have been made accountable for her role in the admission scam? Absolutely. I'm not trying to say that she had no responsibility in that situation and that the conversation around her in it shouldn't have happened. However, I do not believe she needed to have been held accountable for the phenomenon of wealthy people doing unethical things to get ahead. I also don't believe she should have been held accountable for using her wealth and privilege on YouTube. First of all, because she was a teenager when she started her channel and the type of content she made obviously was in demand and was popular. I also don't personally believe her using her money and access to boost her channel was unethical because this wasn't done in malice or on the back of someone else. This wasn't taking an opportunity away from anyone or taking advantage of her audience. If anyone should be held accountable for flex content, an argument could be made that it's us, the viewers. And this is the last argument I want to make in this video that isn't necessarily related to Olivia Jade, but has everything to do with how social media's Eat the Rich is failing the overall philosophy that it tries to represent. When we criticize society for admiring unethical wealth, let's not forget that we are society. We celebrate people for amassing an amount of wealth that cannot be spent in several lifetimes. We celebrate billionaires in our culture, while the majority of people in this world live life beneath poverty lines. While I'm aware that many people see the there are people starving argument as a cliche, whatever that means, it is still astounding how admirable we find the obscenely wealthy as a collective when issues of poverty are known to basically everyone. It is not to say the uber rich don't get criticized or that unethical questions are not up, we saw that there is plenty of criticism to go around in this video, but we still live in a world where being uber wealthy is something to aspire to, something to display to the world, to flex on, to rub in people's faces almost. It is such an aspiration that people get into debt just so that they could pretend to be uber wealthy on social media. That wouldn't happen unless people admired wealth more than they criticized it. People wouldn't make such an effort to pretend that they are at a level of wealth that most people would deem immoral. And this is a point that I find so fascinating. Most of us, myself included, would like to have more money than we do. We would all love to be able to buy something we need or something we want without wondering if we can afford it. We would all love to pay our university tuition without worry, to go to the dentist as soon as we need to and not drag it on for as long as possible because there are other more urgent expenses. And many people fantasize about living in a beautiful home with an extra bedroom or two, going on vacations more often, having a car. There's nothing fundamentally immoral or unethical about about wanting to live comfortably. But there is a world of difference between wanting to have extra money for treats and emergencies and craving to accumulate so much wealth that you don't even have any use for it. Having a garage full of luxury cars, one to match each outfit or whatever quirky things billionaires say to explain why they have 30 supercars. Having a dedicated closet the size of most people's
people's apartments for your 200 Birkins, which cost anywhere between 200 and 500 thousand dollars each, having a mansion with 12 bedrooms and 4 living rooms for your 3 person family, and being proud of this obnoxious wealth knowing that while you bought a dumb purse with diamonds on it for half a million dollars, someone in your state has died from a reason related to poverty. If the audience didn't reward this display of selfishness, people would not put it out there, and if people didn't put it out there, less people would be inspired to want to live like that. All that being said, we have to ask ourselves if people who make content around displaying their wealth are themselves unethical in seeing the opportunity to make content that is in high demand. We need to ask why we demand this content, because frankly, people take advantage of opportunities they benefit from. I believe criticizing the wealthy is justified. And in this video essay, I wasn't trying to make the point that we shouldn't have these criticisms. I just think it's funny to criticize extreme wealth and at the same time encourage it, and more importantly, not see the direct connection connection between social praise of wealth and people's drive to attain wealth so that they could be socially praised. The college admission scheme hit people so hard because it can be shocking to see how far people are willing to go to push themselves or their loved ones forward, but I doubt anyone was truly surprised by it. Rich kids having their ways into elite education bought for them by their parents or getting prominent positions and jobs thanks to nepotism and social connections is not news to anyone. The understanding that these positions are actively taking away from people who might be more qualified or deserving also isn't a novelty. And we need to criticize it as a society, but the way we treated the college scandal specifically was so incredibly unhelpful, point in case. No real change occurred since then, and that happened three years ago. I think we all felt a bit helpless, and what ended up happening was that we found a target for our frustration and used it as a punching bag. None of this was to say we have to feel bad for Olivia Jade. I personally do think she was put in a horrible position, was definitely too young to handle any of this, and I do think that this happening to her was very regrettable. If you disagree, you are very much entitled to, and I would also agree that she seems to be doing just fine and is back to making the same content and rebuilding her platform. But I do think that we can reflect on that situation and try to unpack how we handled it as a community. Ask if we really thought any of this was constructive, if any of this had potential to make change to a great injustice that exists in our world, or if it was just a way to blow off steam and take our aggression out on someone that we chose to believe deserved it. Before going back to just accepting and even supporting the very things that we so adamantly spoke against at the time. Thank you very much for making it to the end of this video. I really hope that you found the topic interesting and that you enjoyed the painting process of this piece. So as I said in the intro of today's video, I'm going to start streaming on Twitch as I finally have a computer that can manage it. I'm just really excited to finally be able to play a bunch of games that I've had uh, for years now and I couldn't play because I didn't have a PC. And so I thought while I'm playing these games and finally getting to enjoy them, I would really want to share that experience with you. And just as like a general disclaimer, I'm not really good at gaming. I've never been really good. I like to play RPGs and specifically open world, although not always. And I just always end up getting lost or being stuck or I waste a lot of time trying <laughs> to cower away from my enemies. But I really, really, really enjoy playing video games and I just wanted to do it together with you if you're interested. So the big question is when I'm gonna start streaming. I have basically everything in place already, except for the fact that I currently can't get into my old Steam account. And that's the account that has all of my games. I will give myself a couple more days to try and figure it out. And if not, then I will just buy new games, unfortunately. I will keep you updated on my community tab a few days in advance when I want to start streaming and I already have everything under control. If you have any suggestions for other things you want me to do on stream, like uh, more art-related content or uh, anthropology-related, I don't know, anything you want me to stream, I would love to stream for you. And so, yeah, uh, thank you again for making it to the end of this video. Uh, please let me know what you think about the topic of conversation. Do you think that I was being too lenient with Olivia Jade and the whole college admission scandal? If you want to give any interpretations to the painting, you're always invited to do so in the comment section. 
Like this video if you enjoyed it, dislike the video if you didn't enjoy it, consider subscribing to my channel if you enjoy this type of content. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.